Gospel according to St. Luke. Now about eight days after these sayings, Jesus took with him Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly they saw two men, Moses and Elijah, talking to him. They appeared in glory and were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and his companions were weighed down with sleep, but since they had stayed, but since they had stayed awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. Just as they were leaving him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. While he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were terrified as they entered the cloud. Then from the cloud came a voice that said, This is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And they kept silent, and in those days told no one any of the things they had seen. On the next day, when they had come down from the mountain, a great crowd met them. Just then, a man from the crowd shouted, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son. He is my only son. Suddenly, a spirit seizes him, and all at once he shrieks. 
It convulses him until he foams at the mouth. It mauls him and will scarcely leave him. I begged your disciples to cast it out, but they could not. Jesus answered, You faithless and perverse generation, how much longer must I be with you and bear with you? Bring your son here. While he was coming, the demon dashed him to the ground in convulsions. But Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit, healed the boy, and gave him back to his father. And all were astounded at the greatness of God. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, o Christ. Gospel according to St. Luke. Now about eight days after these sayings, Jesus took with him Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly they saw two men, Moses and Elijah, talking to him. They appeared in glory and were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and his companions were weighed down with sleep, but since they had stayed, but since they had stayed awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. Just as they were leaving him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. While he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were terrified as they entered the cloud. Then from the cloud came a voice that said, This is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And they kept silent, and in those days told no one any of the things they had seen. On the next day, when they had come down from the mountain, a great crowd met them. Just then, a man from the crowd shouted, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son. He is my only son. Suddenly, a spirit seizes him, and all at once he shrieks. It convulses him until he foams at the mouth. It mauls him and will scarcely leave him. I begged your disciples to cast it out, but they could not. Jesus answered, you faithless and perverse generation, how much longer must I be with you and bear with you? Bring your son here. While he was coming, the demon dashed him to the ground in convulsions. But Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit, healed the boy, and gave him back to his father. And all were astounded at the greatness of God. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Grace and peace be unto you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. The text for the sermon this morning is also the gospel that is appointed for this day. The ninth chapter of the gospel according to St. Luke, beginning to read with verse 28. Fellow servants of Christ Jesus our Lord, do you remember the E.F. Hutton ads on TV a few years back? Here's one of the scenarios. There's a room full of people and all talking at the same time. And over in the corner, an individual whispers to his friend, what do you think the market's going to do? And then the friend re replies, well, my broker is E.F. Hutton, and E.F. Hutton says, and just like that, there is total science, silence, as everyone leans forward to hear what E.F. Hutton has to say. And the voiceover says it all, 
When E.F. Hutton talks, people listen. Well, the transfiguration of Jesus isn't about E.F. Hutton or stocks and bonds or investment portfolios, but it does make a similar point. When someone credible speaks, someone who knows what he or she is talking about, we'd all do well to listen. And if that's the case, can you think of anyone who commands greater respect, greater credibility, greater authority than the person of Jesus Christ? Albert Schweitzer, a man of credibility in his own right, was a theologian, an accomplished organist, a writer, a humanitarian, a philosopher, and a medical doctor. In 1906, he wrote a book which is translated as The Quest for the Historical Jesus. And it summed up a century of theological investigation. For a hundred years, writers had been seeking to find the historical Jesus But Schweitzer answered them saying that one could not separate the Jesus who lived and taught and suffered and died, the real historical Jesus of Nazareth, from the Christ of faith. The Savior who had been proclaimed and believed in the Christian church for centuries. Schweitzer seemed to have the last word, and he did for many years. But then scholars again set off on what is called the second quest to find out who the real Jesus was. The Jesus Seminar, as that movement was called, has been rather famous for going through five Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and the Egyptian Gospel of Thomas and then trying to decide what actions Jesus really took, what words he really spoke. The consensus they seemed to arrive at was that Jesus was a party-goer who liked his drinks, liked his good food, and was a sort of wandering sage. There were other scholars who found different things, And one wonders how a party-going sage would find himself crucified in anybody's, is anybody's guess. For most of these scholars, crucifixion was just the end for old Jesus. And yet Schweitzer's remark of the scholars of the 19th century could just as well be made of those of our own time, that they found when looking for the real Jesus, they found it in themselves. If they wanted a wine-drinking, cheese-and-cracker-eating, scholarly Jesus, that's what they found. Others have wanted to find him as a political rebel or a religious troublemaker, and that at least would account for his being crucified. Mark Twain once remarked that if a person only had a hammer, everything else would look like a nail. And the comment might fit these scholars very well. They find what they are looking for, often a copy of themselves. And they call it Jesus of Nazareth, the real Jesus. Some folks become very disturbed at reading the books and the articles of these scholars. Personally, my faith is not dependent upon the latest scholarly argument or the newest bestseller about Jesus. I put a lot of confidence in the professors of my seminary days. I recalled one of those 
professors this last week, Dr. Ron Halls, who passed away. He taught me a lot, as did all of my seminary professors, and I believed what they told me. And I'm confident that the faith that was handed down, the faith proclaimed in the Bible, is a true faith. Jesus is who the scriptures say he is. And Christ is the one in whom so many have trusted throughout the years. The solid rock, the ground of our faith, the source of our life and being. Dr. Frederick Schutz was president of the Evangelical Lutheran Church and the American Lutheran Church prior to the advent of the ELCA. Once he was visiting New Guinea and he noticed that when he said the word Jesus, the people's faces would light up and they would all smile. And he asked them why they loved Jesus so and one man answered, it's easy to answer your question. Before the missionaries came to us, we lived a life of fear. For us, it seemed as though evil spirits were everywhere, in the woods, in the grass, and even in the stones. And if we built a new house and someone said that an evil spirit had moved into the house, we would not dare spend the night in it. Then the missionaries came. They taught us about God and about Jesus. And when we opened our lives to him, our fears disappeared. And then he beamed and he said, that's why we love Jesus. And Dr. Schutz added, I could see the whole congregation supported his witness. It was worth going to New Guinea to hear this Christian proclaim his love for Jesus, whose presence displaces fear. We proclaim with confidence that the real Jesus has the power to change lives, give hope and courage. But we will never fully understand Jesus. When we try to go behind the biblical picture, we discover that we cannot do it. We will never know what Jesus did in those years between his visit to the Jerusalem temple at the age of 12 and the beginning of his ministry at the baptism in the Jordan River. Did he visit India? Did he visit Tibet? Some people have found this a fascinating theory. Maybe he studied with Buddhist monks in Tibetan monasteries or with Hindus along the banks of the Ganges or learned magic from Egyptian priests. Such fascinating fiction appears more interesting perhaps than just working alongside Joseph in a carpenter shop in Nazareth and going to the synagogue each Saturday. We cannot really know, nor should we. John, the gospel writer, concludes his gospel account. There are also many other things which Jesus did which, if they would be written, I suppose that even the world itself wouldn't have room for the books that would be written. And again, therefore, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And believing in him, we have new and eternal life. This is the real Jesus.
Today is the festival of the Transfiguration. Peter, James, and John accompany Jesus to the top of a mountain. And there Jesus is met by Moses and Elijah, representatives of the law and the prophets. And Jesus is transformed. His face becomes dazzling and his clothes glistening white. Jesus is surrounded by the heavenly presence, and the voice of God is heard saying, This is my beloved Son. Listen to him. This is the real Jesus, but it's not all that there is to Jesus. At his transfiguration, the disciples discovered that Jesus is the Son of God, the chosen one of God who will save the people from their sins by his death and be glorified in his resurrection. And God says to us, listen to him. There is no separation of Jesus of history from the Christ of faith. Jesus is true God, son of the Father from eternity, and true man born of the Virgin Mary. And as Luther's small catechism states, and many of you may remember, he is my Lord. The real Jesus has saved and redeemed me a lost and condemned person. He has freed me from sin, death, and the power of the devil, not with silver or gold, but with his most holy and precious blood and his innocent suffering and death. And all this he has done that I may be his own. And then Luther added, this is most certainly true. The real Jesus is both truly human and truly divine. And I don't know about you, but I can testify he is my Savior and my Lord. The real Jesus, who is Son of God and Son of Man, loves each and every one of us. He leads us through death, his death and our death. And he leads us to the glory of heaven. This is the real Jesus. See him, listen to him, and believe in him. To the glory of God. Amen.